for allowing me to uh, uh, finish up on this study that we looked into last uh, Sunday. We're in the book of Luke, chapter 10. And we're working with verses um, 25 through 37. And what I'd like to do is just, uh, for this, for those that were not here last Sunday, is just briefly uh, go over this uh, to where we left off and then uh, pick it up from there. But if you look at verse uh, 25 in Luke 10, it talks about a certain lawyer that stood up and tempted him. And this, uh, this lawyer was a Pharisee, and he tempted the Lord Jesus, and that word was... Uh, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And uh, it's found in Deuteronomy 6 and also in the other Gospels that uh, the Lord stated this. And in verse 27, he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy, uh, let's see, all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And we've seen that in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, that the only way you can love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind is that He circumcise your heart. And I'll read, I'll read this to you in Deuteronomy 30, in verse 6. There it says, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy seed, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. So the only way we can love our Lord, Jesus Christ, is that we be born again, circumcised of the heart, as it says in Romans 2. He that is the Jew, that's one inwardly. Okay? And then we look at uh, verse 28-29, where it says, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now that's what we're going to work on. Who is my neighbor? That's the question this man asked, and the Lord Jesus is going to answer in a parable form. And so, let's, let's look at verse 30. He says, and Jesus answered, said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now when we look at parables, each thing represents something. Now we went back to Matthew because God, the Lord Jesus uses a little more detailed language in Matthew 13 about the wheat and tares. So that's why I chose to, to uh, read that last Sunday. But he says the, the field is this, the reapers are these, the, the, the children of the kingdom is this, and so forth. Each of them represented something. So the same thing when we work with these verses. Who's the certain man? Who's Jericho? Why Jericho? Why why Jerusalem? Any other city could have been put there. And so we're going to see that this certain man is every one of God's elect. Okay? This is the condition that this, this Samaritan fi found this certain man in. And this is how we're found when the Lord Jesus comes to us. Now, why Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem is a picture of the church and it starts before the foundation of the world in Ephesians. The, the elect, the church, the body of Christ, those that are chosen, the sheep. Okay? So it says, he, he went from Jerusalem to Jericho. And Jericho is a picture of this world where God finds His sheep. Okay? And you could, um, if, you're, if you look in your concordance and look up Jericho, you notice over in the book of Joshua, Rahab was found in Jericho and all her house. And they were the only ones that lived in that city. The Bible says both young and old and, and man and woman were, were destroyed. And it also says the city was destroyed by fire. And you can uh, parallel that with Second Peter chapter 3, where it talks about this works and this earth that will be burned up. And of course... Uh, those they'll be judged, you know, the, the people that are not saved will be destroyed. So there's a parallel there with Jericho as, as where the Holy Spirit goes through this earth and, and, uh, and seeks out to find His elect. 
And that's what, that's what the two spies did. Why did they go right to Rahab's house? You ever think about that? They could have went somewhere. Why did they go to that harlot's house and hide there? Because that's a picture of God is hid in our heart. And that's why their house, that household was saved. And so that's another study altogether. But this is what I'm trying to develop. Jericho, Jerusalem, Jericho. So we've got Jerusalem from the beginning of the world or the church that was founded from Christ. Now we're born into this earth, Jer Jericho, so to speak. And now this is the condition that we're going to be born in. And it says, he fell among thieves and stripped of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And that's a picture of our spiritual condition. We're dead in our sins. We're naked. And we looked at this verse in uh, Revelation 3. I'll read it again. In verse 17, it says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. See how that goes right all together with our spiritual condition? And it says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried by fire, and that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, clothed, and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. And this is being clothed in Christ's righteousness. Okay? This is, this is being filled by the Holy Spirit. And so, it's a beautiful picture here. And as we develop this, we're going we're gonna to see this is exactly, this harmonizes with all the scriptures, all the Bible, the doctrines of the scriptures, and, and so forth. So it, it fits right in with, with the truth of God's word. And so, um, we look in verse 31 there, it says, By chance there came down a certain priest, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Now, in the, um, in the scriptures, the, the Levites in uh, Leviticus, the Levites were set aside to do, perform the duties in the tabernacle. And uh, this, this is a picture of those that are under the law. You see, because they, they couldn't do any, they didn't do anything for this, this person that was uh, come among the thieves. And so, it's, it's also a picture of those that have another gospel. But we're going to see this certain Samaritan did something. He came and bound up this person's womb. He had mercy on them. Where the other ones just passed by, see, and didn't have any mercy. But it's a picture that they couldn't do nothing anyway. They don't, they don't, they have... They don't have the true gospel, see? Those in the world. It's a picture of those coming with the, under the law or those with another gospel. They just pass by. They don't have the love that, uh, that, that, that God says here, love your neighbor as yourself. And, and that comes from being born again. And we're going to see what all this means. The question's asked, who is my neighbor? Okay? So now... We, uh, we looked at, I think we, uh, well, we went down to verse uh, 33. And there it says, a certain Samaritan. Now that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? That's a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, he journeyed, as he journeyed, came where he was. Now that's a beautiful statement. He came to where he was. That, that person didn't come to where Christ was. And that's a picture of our total depravity. See? We can't, we can't, Christ comes to us. We don't go to Him. Jesus says, uh, I, I chose you, you didn't choose me, right? And so, this is what is being taught here. He came to where He was in that spiritual condition. He was, he was wounded, He was half dead, uh, stripped of His raiment. It's a picture of our spiritual condition. Dead. Spiritually dead. And our Lord Jesus Christ comes, came to where he was. Now, let's pick it up. This is where we left off last week. And, and uh, look at the verse 33. When he saw him, he had compassion on him. Now, I know you're probably thinking a few verses right now what can go with this. Okay, and we're going to read some of these verses. 
But when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And I like to go over to, um, if, you, if you turn over to, uh, let's see. I'm getting ahead of myself here, I think. Um, yeah, let's turn over to Luke 15 and verse 20 and see the same, almost identical language. Luke 15 and verse 20. It says, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And it's really the same type of teaching here. Of, of this Father being a picture of our, our Heavenly Father and God Himself that comes to us while He is yet a, a long way off and, uh, and He had compassion. And of course, we're familiar with Romans 9 and, and, uh, and verse, starting with verse 11. He says, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said to her, The elder shall serve the younger. And as, as, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau I have hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he had said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. See how that goes right with it? He, this... This uh, certain Samaritan had compassion on him. That's a picture of every one of God's elect. Okay, see how this all harmonizes with Scripture? Nothing is out, out there left field. Everything is right in line with the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're dead, spiritually dead, and, and Christ finds us in this, in this condition. And He comes to us. Now, Look at verse 34. We'll pick it up there. In verse 34, it says, He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and sent him, sent him on his own beast and brought him to an end and took care of him. Now this Greek word bound means to bind up, to bandage. And he bound up his wounds. And we know the wounds are our sins. Okay? So let's look at some scripture that has to do with uh, binding up or, or bound up our wounds. In Psalms 147 and verse 3, 147 and verse 3, there it says, the, He healeth the broken heart and bindeth up their wounds. Okay? That goes right what we're talking about today. And also in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 34, verse 11 and 16. Ezekiel 34, 11 and 16. There it says, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I even I will both search my sheep and seek them out. And then down in verse 16 it says, I will seek that which was lost, bring again that which was driven away. I will bind up that which was broken and will strengthen that which was sick, but I will destroy the fat and strong and I will feed them with judgment. I will bind up that which was broken. See how that goes right along? Let me read another one. In Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 26. Isaiah 30 and 26. There it says, Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. The light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days. And the day that the Lord bindeth up the, the breach of His people and healeth the stroke of their wound. Okay? So it all harmonizes. This is, what, this is the gospel. This is someone becoming born from above. And of course, in Isaiah 53, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but in verse 5, listen to this here. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The just chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed okay with the with the stripes of our lord jesus christ when he became sin for us that was the healing agent for our sins okay and so this is how one is become saved and that and uh with that verse also in first peter 2 
is, is real similar language there. First Peter 2.24 Who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Okay? So this, this man that was along the road that was come under the thieves the certain Samaritan the Lord Jesus Christ came to him bound up his wounds but notice the language, going back to Luke 10. Notice what it says here. In verse uh, 34. Pouring in oil and wine. Isn't that something? Pouring in oil and wine. On that, on that wound. The wounds is our spiritual condition. And it's used, it's used to heal these wounds up. So let's look at what oil and what wine represents. Okay? So what we're going to do, let's go over to Matthew uh, 25. We'll just see how God uses the word oil in the scriptures. And we're going to see that this is a beautiful picture of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit dwelling in those that are saved. Okay, And, and look at Matthew 25 and verse. Um, start with verse 4. If you're familiar with this parable of the, of the wise... And the foolish here, look at verse 4. It says, the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. In other words, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. The oil represents the gospel, the Holy Spirit of Christ. They had the Holy Spirit in their lamps. In other words, were, the Holy Spirit dwelled in them. Okay, now look at verse 10. It says, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in. See? That's how you get ready, is being born again. It says, They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Now why is, is God just saying, Lord, Lord? When, when, uh, when in Isaiah it says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God. And... and, and uh, We've got the absence of the Holy Spirit here in these ones that are not filled with the oil. So that's why he says, Lord, Lord, open up to us. Twice. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. And that's why in verse 12, he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. But the ones that had the oil, he knows. That's his sheep. See how it all fits in? So the oil is a picture of those that are born from above, that are born and filled of the Spirit of God. Now, let's look at another... Uh, well, let me read this in Proverbs 21 and verse 20. It, uh, there it says, There is treasure be, to be desired in oil in the dwelling of the wise. See how that goes? The Holy Spirit is dwells in the believer. And then in 2 Kings, there's another parable there where it talks about Elisha asked the woman, uh, what is thou in thy house? And she, she responded, um, she said, not anything save a pot of oil. And that's, and that's what a, a God's elect or a, a believer answers. I have nothing in me except the Holy Spirit. See, I have nothing in thy house save a pot of oil. And so see how the oil is used as a picture. Uh, and in the Old Testament it was used to light to, use, uh, to light the lamps and so forth. And Christ says to let your light shine for, you know, that, he may see, uh, that people may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. And so it all harmonizes with what we're looking at. So what does the wine represent? So we pour, he poured the oil, he poured, and now he pours the wine on here. And we know that the wine is also shows, associated in, in the healing of our sin, which has to be the gospel has to be the blood of Christ. It has to be the, it, it's all connected. The Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit that washes away our sins. So we, and I'll, I'll show you some scripture in, in, uh, that teaches this. In Isaiah 55, look at verse 1 there through 3. Isaiah 50, 55. <clears throat> there it says, Ho, every man that thirsteth, and come ye to the waters, he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat, yea, buy wine and milk. 
Now, of course, he's not talking about physical wine and milk. So what it, it has to represent something. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Well, do you remember in John, he says, the Lord Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh, drink my blood, you have no life in yourselves. Come and eat uh, wine and milk. Come and take in. Take in the gospel. That's how you can, you're going to have life. In fact, over in 1 Peter, it, it talks about, um, it uses milk over there. But in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, it says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. So see, milk and wine is, 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 is intimately related there as far as the gospel. And it goes right with the oil. See, this is what we need to be saved. We need the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we need the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And this is how someone is healed uh, from their sins. Someone is healed from being spiritually dead. It's a beautiful picture of salvation. And uh, let's go over to, I'll give you another one, over in Luke chapter 5, and verse 37. Luke 5 and 37. Look at, look, uh, look at the language there. In Luke 5, 37 and 38. No man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst, the bottles will be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put in new bottles, and both are preserved. Okay? So, in other words, what it's saying here is, is no man, you can't put the gospel into an old nature. The bottles is being our inward dwelling, is what's it, what dwells us. You have to have a new nature when, when, the, when the new wine is put in us. If you're not, it's going to perish. And that word perish in the Greek is the same word in, in Romans, uh, or Matthew 10, 28, where the Lord Jesus says, um, I'll read that there, Matthew 10, 28. The Lord Jesus says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not yet able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul, both soul and body in hell. That word destroy is the same word perish. So you need to have that, that new nature. In fact, these words new and old is, this, is, uh, is used over in Scripture. Um, let me give you an example. Let's see, for example, let's go to Colossians 3. I'll show you how the new and the old is used. Colossians 3, 9 and, 9 and 10 there. It says, lie, lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man. See that? Old bottles. Well, you put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. So there's your new nature. You must be born again. So... So if you don't have the, the, the new wine, which is the gospel, into, the, into a new nature, it's, the Bible says they're going to perish. You, you're going to be judged for your sins. They're not, they're not really uh, saved. Okay, so there the new wine it represents the gospel or the Holy Spirit. So it, it all fits in, the blood of Christ. Now, in verse, going back to Luke 10, it says, He set... The Samaritan set him on his own beast and brought him to an end. Now, what does this beast represent? Okay, why he took the, he took this man that was spiritually dead. He poured oil and wine and he set him on this beast. Now, this word beast is derived from a Greek word that means uh, to to acquire, to own, to purchase. It's a figure or picture of the church. Christ purchased us. This is the beast that this certain Samaritan sat on. The Holy Spirit comes upon us when we're saved. And so it's a picture of the, it's the same example over in Luke 19. If you look at verse 30 there, Luke 19, verse 30, it says, uh, And ye go to the village over against you, in which you're, in which you're entering, you shall find a colt tied there, or on Yet it never a man set. Loose him and bring him hither. It's, a, it's the same picture, the colt and the, 
and the donkey there is a picture of the church. Notice it says, loose him. It's the same word over in John 11 where, where uh, he told Lazarus, loose him, unbind him. It's, it's being set free in Christ. And this is, this is a picture of the church. And in verse 29, he sent two of his disciples. You see how he sent two to go get this donkey and to loose them. And this is what God used. We are instruments in God's hand to bring the gospel so that he could bring the sheep into his fold. And so, and, 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 um, and you could go over to Matthew 21 where it talks about the two, the donkey and the colt. But here Luke is just referring to the colt. But notice, it says in verse 35, And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they set Jesus thereon. And that's, and that's the same idea as in, in Luke 10. Christ sits upon the church. Okay, and in Matthew 21, the donkey and the colt, it says they set Jesus on, on them, both of them. Okay, and, and so it's a picture of the church, and this was instrumental in bringing this person that was dead into the end. You see that? The, the, it was instrumental in bringing that dead person, that the Good Samaritan poured the oil, oil and wine into this end. So we're going to look at what this end means now. Okay? So if uh, just follow me on this. If you see that the, the beast is a picture of the church and it's instrumental. And, the Lord, and notice in, in Luke 19, I'll read this again. When he sent the, the, um, the two of his disciples, he says there, if any men ask you, he says, tell them the Lord has need of them. See, that goes right with the church. And this is what God uses to bring others into the kingdom. That's why he says, who is my neighbor? He's talking to this, giving an answer to this person, who, who the neighbor is. And we're seeing that this is, a, this is the condition of anyone and everyone that's, that's spiritually dead. Okay? Those, those next door, our, our aunts and uncles, our sons and daughters, or anybody that's in that condition is our neighbor, okay? And so he, he sets him on his own uh, beast and brought him to the end. Now this Greek word end in, in the, uh, means a lodging place, a resting place. It's derived from two words that's translated all, every. It's, in the, sa it's the same word. Uh, John 6, 37, where Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. That word, all. And it's also translated receive. In, uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13, it says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when we, you received the word of God, that word received is derived from this word end. When ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but it, as it is the truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So it's a picture when we are saved, we have the oil and the wine, we're brought into the end. We're brought into Christ, the resting place. Jesus says that, uh, didn't he say somewhere, is it John 12, uh, Matthew, that he says, uh, come to me all you who labor and heavy labor, I'll give you rest. And so it all ties together. And so this beast, as he told his disciples, go get those, that donkey and colt. I'll loose them, bring them to me. The Lord has need of them. Here, he used the beast to set the, this man on and bring them to the beast. It's the same picture. We, the church is used to be... And, and he entered into the, the end, just like when we're born again, we enter into the kingdom of God. And so, as the gospel goes forth, and we're going to see this too. Notice in verse 35, he says, On the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will, I will repay you. Now this word, um, end keeper, or host, is the word end keeper in the Greek. Okay, so when he came to the, 
the inn, he told the innkeeper. Who is the innkeeper? Because this innkeeper is, is told to take care of this person. Well, it's the church. It's the church that we are to take care of. And um, do you know, do you remember in uh, Genesis 4? Let's read that. In Genesis 4 and verse 9. Genesis 4 and verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is, thy, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. You see that? We are our brother's keeper. And so here the innkeeper, the, the Lord Jesus says, um, take care of him. And notice he gave him two pence. You know, why two? Why not one? Four, five, why two pence? The, the two, again, is a picture of used in the church. And so, this is what we do. We, we take care of the members of our body, the members of Christ. That we feed them the bread of life. We, uh, we pray for one another. We bring the gospel. And, and this, is, this is the task that God has given as, as he told this innkeeper to take care of him. And pence... Uh, why pence? You know, it's a, a, we're given the gospel. We're entrusted the gospel. God has given the church the gospel, and with the, the gospel we feed, we nourish, and uh, it's used for healing. Okay, the innkeeper is, is going to continue to heal this person and, and, and to refresh them and to nourish them on the gospel. And in Psalms chapter 30, in verse 2 there, 30 verse 2, get over there and read that. 30 and verse 2, it says, O Lord my God, I cried unto Thee, and Thou hast healed me. And then in 41.4, it says, I said, Lord, be merciful unto me, heal my soul, for I have sinned against Thee. So it's again the oil and wine, the innkeeper. We're, 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 to, we're to bring the gospel. We're to nourish it. And after all, when you share the gospel and that the, the, the neighbor, that our neighbor, that's our love for our neighbor, that they don't go into eternal damnation. See? That's the greatest gift that we can give anybody. It's not baking a cake and giving. No, that's all fine. But. But what, what's more pleasing, baking a cake and giving it to your neighbor or, or sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? You see? And, and uh, that's for eternity, the gospel. And so this is, this is what uh, the whole Bible is about, is about those uh, be escaping judgment, escaping eternal damnation through the blood of Christ. And that's the, the best thing that we can give somebody. I know people would come up and ask me for some money, you know. And I said, I've got something better for you. Here's a gospel track, you know. And maybe here's a dollar or something along with it. But read the gospel track because that's, that's for eternity, okay. And so uh, you think about these things and you, you know that that's exactly what, what, what salvation is all about, what we're here on. That's why Rahab went and told all her family, that's our desire. We want to see our sons, our, our brothers, our sisters in the kingdom of God. And, and then, of course, uh, it goes, spreads out. We go, we, we go to our neighbor, those that are lost. And that's the spiritual condition of everybody. They're lost. They're dead. They're half dead. Physically alive, spiritually dead. This whole world's like that. And so, look at, um, look at verse... Um, Let's see, where are we at now? And let's go to verse 36. Or 35 there, I'm sorry. The verse 35, it says, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will, I will repay thee. Now this Greek word is only found twice in the, in, the, in the Bible, this word come again. And it's used in connection with the, it means return. It's, it's used in connection with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, take care of him. And when I come again, I will repay you. See, he's talking to the church. And, and so 
Let's look at, uh, for example, in Luke 19, how this word's used, starting with verse 12. In Luke 19, 12, he says, He said, therefore, a certain noble, nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. See, that word return there is come again. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Now notice how he's giving them money. See? Why, the money's the gospel. What are you going to do with the gospel? Are you, are you going to hide it? Are you going to, are you going to use it? As the Lord says, I have need of them to bring others into the kingdom as God uses that beast. Or he told his disciples, go and, and I'm buying those, that donkey and colt and bring them to me. Because we have the message of salvation in our hearts. What we share. And so here it says, uh, but his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, the coming of the Lord Jesus, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. But it's a picture of what we do with the gospel. Are we going to hide it? Are we going to share it? Okay? And uh, so, so he says, when I come again, I will repay. And what's the repayment? What's the reward that we're going to get? If you look at Luke 18 and, and verse 28, and 30, there it says, and, and Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that have left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive many fold more in this present time and the world to come, life everlasting. So that's the reward, the repayment that we have. We have eternal life. And so what I'd like to do is uh, quickly look at an uh, example um, in, uh, as far as uh, look, at, look at the response in Luke chapter 10 there in verse 37. Jesus said, or the certain Samaritan said, he that, well no, Jesus said, he, and he said, he that showeth mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, go and do thou likewise. Go and do thou likewise. In other words, whatever the good Samaritan do, do it likewise. See that? And he's telling that person, go and do it likewise. It's the same word in Matthew 28 where Jesus says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And also in Mark 16, Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so let's look at an example quickly that, that demonstrates this. Let's go over to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 and look at verse 27 there. It says, When he went forth to a land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils a long time and wore no clothes. Now he was naked also. The same picture. Neither abode in any house but in tombs. Spiritually dead. Okay, now notice verse, um, look at verse 38, when he became saved. It says there, um, or excuse me, verse 35. It says, then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Clothed in Christ, in the, having the mind of Christ, in his right mind. And notice what he did in verse 38. Now the man of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, Return to thy house and show how great things God had done to thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. And I looked up the word published. And in the Greek it means, and you could do this yourself if you have a strong concordance or Young's, but in the Greek it means to proclaim, to herald. He's heralding, he's proclaiming the gospel. And notice how the Lord blessed that in verse 40. He says, and it came to pass that when Jesus returned, because this whole city, and Mark tells us in Decapolis, is where this 
this man went and, uh, back to his own house. But it says here, and it came to pass that when Jesus was, was returned, the people gladly received him. See that? This man that, was, that the demons went out, born again, filled with the Spirit, clothed in his right mind, went to... And, and, said, and the Lord said, go and publish throughout the whole city what great things Jesus has done. And because of that, it says the city received him. And that word is in connection with receiving the Lord Jesus Christ, receiving the word of God. And so the Lord uses the church. He used that little Israelite girl to bring Naaman to go wash in the Jordan. Go, go to the Samaritan and prophet. The, the woman at the well says, come see a man, right? Uh, there's uh, Peter, or uh, Philip, the, the Spirit told Philip, go up and talk to that man in, in the chariot. And so this is the church. This is, a, this is why Jesus says, go and do thou likewise. Do you, do you see it? it? Go pour oil and wine. And this is how the spiritual dead are healed. And, um, and there's this, I'll just quickly close with this. There's, um, how about you can win, say, maybe I'm not real good at bringing the gospel or witnessing, but do you know you can win somebody without the word? You know the Bible says that? In 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, listen to this language in verse uh, 1. Likewise, ye wives, be subject to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of their wives, by the behavior. You see that? You can be a witness by your behavior without the word. God can use that. It says it right there. They can be one without the word. And so that word one is used in connection with uh, Paul saying that I may win Christ. It's the same Greek word. It's, it's becoming saved. And so... So that's why Jesus says, let your light shine before men. So, so, so at work, uh, whenever, wherever, you, wherever you're at, to be a testimony, to be a light for Christ. You know, something different about that person. Uh, he's not cursing. He's not, he's not, you know, getting in the pools of football games. Or, you, know, you could put anything you want there. You know what I mean? Uh, the Bible says we to, to let our light shine. In Leviticus, it says... Um, uh, thou shalt not put a stumbling block before the blind. So when we're around the lost, we, let's, we need to act like the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be an imitator of him. Because if you're not, if you act like a worldly person, you're putting a stumbling block before the blind. And so um, I, let's just close with one. I know I'm a little bit late. I, please forgive me. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. It says, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Thank you for this time.